Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Gardening for Pollinators. This is a third in a series hosted by Windsor and Wyndham Chapters of UVM Extension Master Gardeners. It has been funded through generous donations from individuals and UVM County Chapters. Sam Maskell of Rockingham Library in Bellows Falls, Vermont is providing the technical assistance. The two presenters for this program are Susan Still and Peg Solon. Peg Solon is a retired administrator in higher education who moved to Vermont from Boston in 2019. She became a UVM Extension Master Gardener that same year and chaired the State Gardening Conference with Susan Still, her co-presenter, in 2020. She is passionate about the art and science of gardening and permaculture and has been developing a pollinator garden since she moved here. She has the long-term goal to convert as much of her property to native plants and wildlife habitat as possible. Susan Still is a retired organizational development consultant specializing in nonprofits. She moved to Saxons River, Vermont in 2013 and created a structured English style garden as a companion to her 1890 Victorian house. She works on reducing lawn and adding natives every year and finds that you can pack a lot of plants into a half acre of land. Welcome, Susan and Peg. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our presentation on growing a pollinator garden, restoring habitat in your own backyard. Peg and I are UVM Extension Master Gardeners, and we've been studying pollinators and native plants over the last several months. We've developed this presentation with master composter and soil expert Kat Buxton. Unfortunately, Kat has another presentation today. We also had input from master gardener Nicole Conti Stevens. We want to let you know that we are not experts. We are uh, students of, of gardening as uh, we all are. As we learn more, we, uh, as usual, we know, how, we see how much we don't know. In fact, uh, there are probably many of you today who know more than we do. Our purpose today is to encourage everyone to develop a backyard habitat and to encourage others to do so. If you would like to put your questions into the chat, we'll try to answer questions at the end of our slideshow. In the future, we hope this presentation can include a hands-on in-person component where we go outside and explore a garden. So, entomologist Doug Tallamy says that, quote, gardeners have become important players in the management of wildlife. He says that gardeners can make a difference to, quote, the future of biodiversity, to the native plants and animals of North America and the ecosystems that sustain them. Pollinators are an important piece of the puzzle of restoring an ecosystem. So here's some of the things you'll learn today, that pollinators are important, that they need our help. You'll learn about the role of native plants, and you'll learn lots of ways to help. Whether you're just learning about pollinators and native plants or are already an expert, we're hoping that by the end of the session, you will decide to take one more step in restoring habitat in your garden. Your garden is an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community of living things and organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment interacting as a system. So how healthy is your garden's ecosystem? What if homeowners all over Vermont and, and the US and the world for that matter, made their garden ecosystems healthier? Imagine corridors of healthy ecosystems across our area. The interdependent food web. Every living being is an essential part of the interdependent web of life. Although we're talking about pollinators today, we cannot separate out any one piece of the web of life. 
from the microscopic organisms living in soil to the largest mammals, we are all connected. The food web describes the flow of energy and matter through the ecosystem. And don't forget the important function of the soil web that you'll see there on your left. This is really fun, I think, the Jenga theory of ecosystems. One theory of ecosystem, uh, how the ecosystems worked, identifies the critical role played by keystone species. If a keystone species, often an apex predator, is removed, the whole system changes. While this can be true, a newer theory is that an ecosystem is like a tower of Jenga. The tower will keep standing if you remove some of the blocks, but at some point it collapses. According to the Jenga hypothesis, first proposed in the journal Science in 2005, the keystone analogy is too static. It misses the highly dynamic character of real ecosystems, which change continually because of the endless and unpredictable host of factors. Jenga makes a better analogy for that complexity because of its constantly shifting weights and stresses. Much as any individual block can decide the game, the Jenka hypothesis suggests even the most obscure species, a humble plant eater, say, like our pollinators, can turn out under certain, certain circumstances to be the keystone of an entire ecosystem. Sometimes you can remove species from a habitat and other species make up for the loss, allowing the ecosystem to go on as if nothing had changed. In other circumstances, you pull out that same species and the tower comes crashing down. As I understand this theory, we'll have healthier garden ecosystems if we increase biodiversity. Today, we'll focus on the essential role played by pollinators in your garden ecosystem. Between 75 and 95% of all flowering plants on the earth need to be pollinated. Pollinators provide ser pollination services to over 180,000 different plant species and more than 1,200 crops. This picture shows what a food stand would look like with bees and without bees. Almost all plants depend on pollinators to make seeds. Humans depend on those seeds, including fruits, nuts, and beans. About a third of our food depends on pollinators. And the animals we eat generally get their food from pollinator, pollinated plants. It's not just fruit that is dependent on pollinators. It's clothing, medicines, animals, and the entire food chain. About half of the world's oils, fibers, and raw materials depend on pollinators. So what's harming pollinators? Climate change. Climate change is a threat to pollinators. For instance, warm air may cause bees to emerge in spring before the flowers are ready. Pollinators and plants have evolved together and cannot adapt quickly. And you can see on this graph that Vermont is getting wetter. Of course, it's also getting warmer. Landscape fragmentation. Vermont is the third most forested of the lower 48 states with approximately 4.6 million acres of forest land. Despite being so heavily forested, for the first time in over a century, Vermont is actually losing forest cover due to parcelization, subdivision, and subsequent development of land. So development. Look at this lovely suburban development. What do you see here? I see the impervious hardscape, such as asphalt, the pollution from gas powered machines, the minimal plantings on the property, the use of monocultures such as turf grass. Lawns in the US add up to 31 million acres. Think what a difference we could make by reducing lawn and adding native plants. Pesticides. Pesticides include herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, miticides, all designed to kill elements of the ecosystem. 
row crop agriculture. This picture shows row crops of a single species, a monoculture. This reduces diversity of plants, obviously, but also of insects and other animals. Monoculture crops are more susceptible to damage from pests and diseases, which leads to a high level of pesticide use. The soil gets depleted and so lots of chemical fertilizers are used. Invasive plants. Invasive plants are aggressive non-native plants that disrupt habitats and crowd out native plants. Here are just a few examples, buckthorn, burning bush, barberry, and garlic mustard. And by the way, barberry is uh, one of the ones I dislike the most. It is known as a tick nursery. And so the loss of native plants. This is a father gilla in my garden, a lovely native shrub. Um, oh, just a little bit more peg on uh, native plants uh, that we're, we're going to talk about them a lot more later in the presentation. Um, but a thing to understand is that pollinators and native plants have evolved together. Um, pollinators, such as butterflies, when they're in their larval state, are very specific feeders. They can only feed on certain native plants with which they have evolved. So. Uh, Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Ready light, for pol light pollution. <clears throat> Look at this picture. So pollination goes on at night too. Artificial lights, and that's, uh, if it, we're lucky we live in rural areas, but a lot of us have outdoor lighting. Uh, they disorient moths, and research has found that this can impair finding mates evading predators and pollinating plants. A recent study found that nocturnal visits to plants was reduced by 62% in areas with artificial illumination compared to dark areas. Uh, one thing that you can do to mitigate that a bit is, is to use uh, things like yellow light in, uh, take a look at uh, how you can reduce that if you, if you need to have outdoor lighting, um, uh, some other colors like yellow are less harmful. This graph shows the estimated loss of insect populations worldwide. Insects are on a path to extinction. 40% of species are declining, one third are endangered. But there is hope, there has to be hope. Remember that everything in an ecosystem is connected. By creating a pollinator habitat, you are creating a home for birds and many other animals. More than 90% of birds, even seed eaters, need caterpillars, lots of caterpillars, to feed their babies. More than a third of US bird species are insectivorous as adults. So um, we're going to now get into more about what you can do. Peg? Okay, <clears throat> so who are the pollinators? Flies or pollinators? Yes. Flies of all kinds perform some amount of pollination among other important jobs. In Vermont, 71 fly families, which includes many, many species, actually feed at flowers. Globally, flies are important pollinators for agricultural crops. An example is the hoverfly, also called the flowerfly and the surfid fly. Adult hoverflies resemble small wasps with a black and yellow or white striped abdomen. They will hover like a hummingbird as they drink nectar from flowers. Hoverflies don't sting. They range in size from a quarter to a half inch, depending on the species. The adults are the pollinators and it's the larvae that consume pests. Hoverfly larvae are small brown or green maggots that hatch from eggs laid on plants infested with soft bodied pests. Adult females lay up to 100 eggs over the course of their lifetime and cannot reproduce unless they have access to pollen as a food source. 
When the larvae hatch, they feed on pests for a week to 10 days or longer, then drop to the soil to pupate. Adults emerge after two weeks. Typically, there are three to seven generations per year. The pupae will overwinter in the soil or in garden debris, emerging as adults in late May or early June. Hoverflies are valuable partners for us in pest control. They rid your garden of aphids, young cabbage worms, and other caterpillars, and mealybugs, among others. Butterflies. When most people think of pollinator gardens, they think of butterflies, especially monarchs. As important as butterflies are, they are not the most efficient pollinators. Spoiler alert, it's bees. We'll discuss those in a few minutes. But while we may think of the butterfly caterpillars as pests in our gardens, most of these caterpillar larvae fill a very important niche in supporting a foundational part of the food web and ecosystems, feeding birds, insects, and many, many other species. Pollinator gardens can be excellent habitat for caterpillars, and we'll discuss pollinators and insect habitat later on in the presentation. Now we'll focus on bees. There are many kinds of bees and they perform different roles in pollination. Some bees are specialists. They may only pollinate one type of flower or have a specific adaptation that makes them especially good at collecting certain types of pollen. For example, the bumblebee. Bumblebees are master pollinators. In fact, two to three times better than honeybees. Why are they so good? Buzz pollination. Bumblebees use their wing muscles to create vibrations that cause pollen to explode all over their fuzzy bodies. This is very important for some specially shaped flowers, such as tomatoes and blueberries. Many tomato greenhouses import bumblebees for this very reason, which likely contributes to the release of non-native bumblebees. Now, honeybees are not native bees. They're not native to this continent and are a relatively unimportant pollinator in the natural setting. They were originally imported from Europe in the 17th century. For commercial agriculture though, they have become a powerful tool, pollinating over a hundred crops grown commercially in North America. Crops like nuts, blueberries, squash, watermelon, and other fruits are almost entirely dependent on them. Almonds are completely dependent on them. One honeybee colony can gather about 40 pounds of pollen and 265 pounds of nectar. That's a lot of work. The industrial model of commercial honeybees is suffering from colony collapse disorder and other threats. Pathogen spread or spillover can occur when heavily infected domestic hosts interact with closely related wildlife populations. For example, commercially produced bumblebees used in greenhouse pollination often have higher levels of various pathogens than wild bumblebees. These pathogens may spread to wild bees when commercial bees escape from greenhouses and interact with their wild colleagues in the native setting. Approximately 4,000 species of bees are native to North America and about 275 of these are found in Vermont. Most native bees, approximately 75%, are solitary and live in individual nests tunneled into the soil. These bees all have one important habit in common. They feed their offspring pollen. In gathering this food for flowers, from flowers, bees inadvertently transfer pollen grains from one plant to the next, thus allowing the plants to form seeds and fruits. About 20% of our bees are pollen specialists, meaning that they are adapted to gather pollen from just one plant family, genus, or even species. Bumblebees are among the most vulnerable bees in Vermont. The American bumblebee pictured here was once a common bumblebee in the Champlain Valley. It has not been found since a University of Vermont student's unwitting discovery in 2000. A Gund Institute for the Environment study examining 100 years of bumblebee records reveals that almost half of Vermont species, which are vital pollinators here, have either vanished or are in serious decline. Four of Vermont's 17 bumblebee species appear to have gone extinct.
The yellow banded bumblebee, the Bombus terracola, has been feared to be on the brink of extinction in Vermont, but new encounters with this bumblebee during the Gund survey suggest it might be surviving some threats. It was listed as threatened in Vermont, but we'll see how it fares in the future. So pictured in this slide is the rusty patched bumblebee. It's an endangered species under the US Endangered Species Act. Now, here is an interesting story that shows the interconnectedness of species in an ecosystem. The Ashton's cuckoo bumblebee, which is not pictured here, used to infiltrate colonies of the rusty patched and the yellow banded bumblebees. It would enslave the workers and use them to feed its young. But with the yellow banded bumblebee severely depleted and the rusty patched bumblebee now endangered, so goes the invader. The Ashton's cuckoo bumblebee was last seen in 1995 and is also listed as endangered in Vermont. So you can contribute to bumblebee restoration by submitting your observations to bumblebeewatch.org, a project of the Xerces Society and their collaboratives. Susan? Um, Susan, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. As we mentioned earlier, species okay. decline is rising quickly for all insects, and that means butterflies too. Many species are in danger, and some have not been seen in quite some time. Others have gone officially extinct. Pictured here is the early hair streak, Aurora laeta. It's found mostly in the Appalachian Mountains, mostly in tree canopies. Host plants are American beech and beaked hazelnut. But in lab conditions, its larvae have been successfully raised on white oak, Quercus alba, and willow, Salix. Check out Doug Tallamy's new book on the value of oak trees. Um, if you have room for an oak tree, plant one, even a little oak sapling can make a difference. So adult sources for this butterfly are fleabane, oxide daisy, and steeplebush. They depend on mature deciduous and mixed woods. So logging, pest control spraying, and, benef and failure of beech nut crop are possible threats. So moths. This is also part of the Lepidoptera genus, or order rather. Um, this is a hermit sphinx. So moths are nocturnal. This is the night shift for pollinators. Moths are actually more effective pollinators than butterflies, and they are threatened too. The same array of causes uh, are causing significant decline in moth populations with the addition of light pollution, as was mentioned earlier. Moths visit a wide array of flower families. Moths have largely been neglected in pollinator research. Recent research shows that pollen transport occurred more frequently on the moth's ventral thorax than on their mouth parts that have been traditionally targeted for pollen swabbing. So we may be missing a lot of the pollen pollination that moths do. Pollen transport loads suggest that nocturnal moths contribute key pollination services for several wild plant families in agricultural landscapes, in addition to providing functional resilience to diurnal networks, to daytime networks. This is a cousin of the tomato hornworm. So even our garden pests can play an important role in ecosystems. The adult form of the tomato hornworm is a relatively large, robust bodied moth, commonly known as the hawk moth or sphinx moth. The adult moth feeds on the nectar of various flowers and like the larval form, is most active from dusk until dawn. Ants. Ants are social in insects that are great lovers of nectar. These busy insects are often observed visiting flowers to collect energy rich nectar. Ants are wingless and must crawl into each flower to reach their reward. 
ants are more likely to take nectar without effectively cross-pollinating flowers. Sometimes flowers supply nectaries outside the flowers to attract ants that keep other insects from stealing the nectar by entering the flower from the side, forcing them to enter the flower in a way that is more conducive to pollination. Researchers have discovered that some ants are not important pollinators, even though they visit flowers and may have pollen grains attached to their bodies. These scientists discovered that some ants and their larvae secrete a natural substance that acts as an antibiotic. This secretion protects ants from bacterial and fungal infections. Unfortunately for the flowers which are visited by these ants, this secretion also kills a pollen grain very rapidly when it comes in contact with this natural antibiotic. Beetles. Beetles are the most prolific of order of insects. There are more than 340,000 species worldwide with almost 30,000 in North America. Because of their sheer numbers, they are important contributors to pollination, but they are not immune to threat. The nine spotted lady beetle, which used to be abundant across the Northeast United States is no longer here. Florida. <laughs> Ladybugs, that is, they're also known as lady beetles, ladybird beetles, benefit crops primarily by feeding on aphids. Like with tomatoes and bumblebees, many greenhouses import lady beetles to manage aphids. The beetles escape into the wild, affecting native populations. And um, uh, just go back a second here. I want to highlight the lost ladybug project. Okay. Um, this is interesting. If you want to also do some citizen science, you can um, report different ladybugs that you find at this site. Bats. I don't really like bats. Most people don't, but this one is pretty cute. Um, and bats are really... Uh, important to our ecosystems. There is Someone is unmuted and we can't really hear you. So anyway, uh, there are over a thousand bat species on earth. Vermont is home to nine bat species. Five are either endangered or threatened or endangered. And the little brown bat, this one in the picture is endangered in Vermont. Bats in Vermont are insectivores. So while they don't pollinate plants here in Vermont as they do in the Southwestern US, they do provide natural pest control and average bat can eat 1000 to 1200 mosquitoes in a single hour. So say thank you to bats. Peg? Okay, <clears throat> so now that we've seen who the pollinators are, we're going to focus on the resources that will attract them to your landscape. We'll learn the differences between native and non-native plants and why that distinction is so important. And we'll look at some great plants for the pollinators. So what attracts pollinators? Here are the basic elements they need for their survival. Water, habitat for them and their young, and nutritious food. First, let's talk about water. Wouldn't it be great to have a pond, spring, or stream on your property? But they certainly are not necessary. A butterfly puddling area, a bird bath, or other shallow water source, or a water garden are all easy to provide. Here are some creative ideas that people have used in this slide. A dog's water station, a plant pot saucer near a hose, and I love this one, a series of connecting dishes collecting water from a drain spout. How easy is that? Whatever you provide for a water source, it should be within about 300 feet of the smallest pollinators because they would have to expend too much energy trying to get to one that's any further away. And don't forget to provide landing spots for them if the water is deep. The second essential requirement for pollinator survival is shelter. 
Pollinators need a safe place to hide from prey, shelter from inclement weather, and harbor their young. Each species has different needs, so it's important to include lots of different kinds of shelter, as shown here, stems, tree branches, shrubs, wildflowers, leaf litter, undisturbed ground, dead wood, brush piles, and rock piles. Sedges and grasses are also essential because they provide hiding places for the bees. The third element for pollinator survival is nutritious food. That means nectar, pollen, and or insects and other critters. Today we're going to basically um, focus on pollen and nectar though. <clears throat> Given the choice, pollinators almost always are attracted to native plants. That's because native plants have co-evolved with them and provide them with the right amounts and quality of nectar and pollen at the right time in their life cycles to satisfy their energy needs. Nectar contains sugars, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals. Pollen is full of protein. Butterflies need to consume nectar from flowers and just happen to spread pollen in the process. Bees, on the other hand, intentionally collect pollen. Along with nectar, they feed on pollen and they bring it home to feed their young. If the plant's anatomy doesn't match the pollinators, the pollinator has a hard time acquiring the nutrients in it. Many non-native plants are not recognizable to the pollinators because of structural and color differences. And many times the nutrients, <clears throat> excuse me, in the non-natives are indigestible for them. Look at all the different shapes and sizes of the flowers in this chart. Some are spiky, some have flat pads, some are tubular. Each is attractive to different species of pollinators for different reasons. When you think about how butterflies get access to nectar, you can imagine which flower structures are best for them. And the same goes for all the pollinators. Structure has other implications for pollinators survival as well. Plants with single blooms have been found to be more nutritious than double bloomed flowers, for instance, because making the extra bloom costs the plant in energy resources otherwise have gone into making nectar. Structure, shape, color, bloom time, species, all matter. So here's an example of the importance of flower structure. Researchers at the Mount Cuba Center Trial Gardens in Delaware completed a study of Phlox paniculata in 2017 and found that Phlox paniculata gina was visited by flowers five times more often than the next best performer. They theorized that the tightly packed small flowers provided a concentrated area that allowed butterflies to feed more efficiently with less energy. Note the bright pink color and the ample landing space for the butterfly in this photo. So Phlox paniculata is actually native from New York to Iowa, south to Georgia, Mississippi, and Arkansas. But this was just a great example of the fact that it really matters. In addition to structure, plants have refined several other traits to attract pollinators to them. The US Forest Service has developed this awesome chart based on pollinator syndromes which are collections of plant characteristics that are attractive to pollinators due to their co-evolution. These traits are color, nectar guides, which are markings on the flower petals that guide the pollinator to the nectar sites, much like the landing lights on an airport runway. That's so cool. Also odor, the presence or absence of nectar and pollen and the flower shape. In this chart, we can see that bees are attracted to bright white, yellow, blue, and ultraviolet colors. Nectar guides like the streaks you see on the flower in this photo, fresh, mild, pleasant odors, the presence of nectar and sticky scented pollen, and tubular flowers, ones with symmetrical petals and ones with enough space to land on. <clears throat> Humans are blind to ultraviolet light, but bugs can see it and boy, are they lucky. Ultraviolet fluorescence photography gives us a hint of how flowers look to pollinators. Notice the nectar guides on the plant at the top right. Isn't that beautiful? Actually, they're all beautiful. 
I'd love to see them the way a bee sees them. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, butterflies only consume nectar from flowers and just happen to spread pollen in the process. They don't have mouths and can only sip liquid food using a long tube like proboscis. With their long proboscis and light weight, butterflies can access nectar in various parts of a flower, including at the base of the stamens and the stigma. Their skinny legs don't pick up much pollen as they perch on a flower and unfurl their proboscis into it. Here's a short video showing the proboscis at work and at rest. You can see that it's probing, probing, and then it curls up um, as it's resting. I had never seen a video like that before, so up close. The traits that attract butterflies are bright colors, including red and purple, the presence of nectar guides, faint but fresh odors, ample deeply hidden nectar, limited amounts of pollen, and narrowly tubular spurred flower shapes or flowers with wide landing pads. Birds on the other hand are attracted to scarlet, orange, red, and white flowers they don't need nectar guides or follow odors, but they, especially hummingbirds, are attracted to flowers with ample deeply hidden nectar and those with large funnel shapes, cups, and strong perch support. Birds also forage for insects and are not dependent on pollen for protein. Now here's a video of a ruby-throated hummingbird feeding. Its wings beat 50 to 70 times per second. Its heart beats approximately 1200 times per minute and it must consume half its weight each day just to keep up with its metabolism. So you can see how essential it is that it has plentiful and nutritious sources of food in its habitat like this cone flower. So now let's dive a little more deeply into native plants and the difference between them and the non-natives. We'll start with some definitions, which can get very tricky. So plants that grow in habitats in which they evolved are called native plants. A plant is considered a native if it has occurred naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without human introduction. Native plants help the environment most when planted in places that match their growing requirements. Some examples of Vermont native pollinator plants are Baptisia tinctoria, that's the yellow wild indigo, which you'll see later in this presentation, Helianthus divaricatus, the woodland sunflower, Monada lamialis, which is bee balm or also known as wild bergamot, Symphio trichum novianglia, our lovely New England aster and Asclepius incarnata, the swamp milkweed, which is a really important one for the monarchs. Now a nativar is a plant that has been developed from a locally sourced species. It actually stands for native cultivar. Nativars can occur spontaneously in the wild, but most often are developed by plant breeders for desirable characteristics such as new colors that make them marketable. Here's the thing though, although they might be attractive to humans, they're not guaranteed to provide the same level of nourishment, support and other benefits as true native plants on which the wildlife in our region have come to depend. So now we have hybrids and cultivars. A hybrid is a plant that has been bred from two different species, subspecies, varieties, cultivars, or even genera to achieve a particular set of characteristics. A cultivar, on the other hand, is a plant or group of plants that have been selected from a naturally occurring species and they're bred to either enhance or maintain a particular set of desirable characteristics. Both are maintained by propagation through cutting and grafting and cannot be grown from seeds from the parent plant. 
So the difference between native plants and the nativars, also there are varieties, hybrids, and cultivars, is that the natives evolved in their habitats over eons without help from us. The rest have been manipulated by us in one way or another. And just a word about varieties. Varieties has a, it's a term that can be used from a biological point of view or a legal point of view. And a lot of breeders have varieties. And um, so I didn't include that Blizzard, in your, stop it. Blizzard. because it's such a legal term as anything. Stop it, Blizzard. Bad dog, gosh. Um, someone is not muted. So if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, go to your mute button and um, and mute. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so, so to wrap up the difference between native plants and non-native plants, native pollinators have evolved with the native plants in their region. Their, bird, their bodies are perfectly suited for each other. Native plants are recognizable to pollinators, while many non-natives are not. Studies have shown that pollinators are more attracted to these plants than to non-natives because they provide more and more nutritious nectar and pollen in digestible form. And natives provide habitat. Many are the only hosts that specific pollinators will choose to lay their eggs on. An example is milkweed, a native plant of extreme importance to monarch butterflies who use it exclusively as a host plant for their young. The milkweed leaves shelter the young from predators and are the only food that the young can eat. So now let's get to some great pollinator plants and let's start with some spring bloomers. Here we see Dutchman's breeches, the photo on the left. It's a tiny mat forming ephemeral plant that appears in early spring, providing much needed nutrition as they are also emerging, a great example of the importance of bloom time in the life cycle of pollinators. Put these ephemeral beauties in a spot for longer lasting flowers. Jacob's Ladder on the right has fragrant bluish to purplish blooms and thrives in sunny to partly shady areas. With its fragrant odor and the nectar guides that you can see in the close-up photo at the right, you can guess how especially attractive it is to bees. Geranium maculatum in the photo on the left is one of my favorites because it gives so much both nutritionally to the pollinators and aesthetically to us. It starts blooming in the spring, but then it keeps on blooming right into fall. It first shoots up beautiful dark green foliage, then by late spring develops bright pink or white flowers. Then by the end of summer, the flowers give way to distinctive seed capsules that resemble crane's bills. And for a final delight, it shoots its seeds into the air, which can be quite a show. Bloodroot, on the other hand, is an ephemeral that develops beautiful cloak-like leaves that unfurl to reveal striking white flowers with yellow centers before disappearing as temperatures rise. The plants shown here are primarily summer bloomers, but they can take you from spring right into winter. Lupinus perennis is a pollinator powerhouse, providing excellent nutrition for native bees and butterflies and serving as host plant for the endangered Connor blue butterfly among others. That is as long as it is a true native <clears throat> because, um, oops, uh, it, as long as it's a true native and not a cultivar or a hybrid. Many people shudder at the thought of lupins in their gardens because they're such aggressive spreaders. But for some landscapes, they are appropriate and they start blooming in spring. So they're a great plant during that transition time between the dying of spring blooms and the set of summer ones. Monada didyma does very well in both gardens and meadows. Hummingbirds seem to take particular delight in it. It's deer resistant, but edible for humans, and it's another nutritional powerhouse for all the pollinators. Baptisia tinctoria is a hardy, long-lived nitrogen fixing plant that bees especially go crazy for, and it remains beautiful into winter with its blue-black seed pods that really show up. 
It's a versatile plant that does well in all sorts of settings, upland and lowland woods, shrub borders, woodland edges, and along stream banks. The take home message here, especially regarding lupins, is to assess your own landscape, consider species that are right for it. The wrong plant for someone else's garden might be just the right one for yours. Symphotrichum novi anglia, and excuse both my Boston accent and stumbling over some of these Latin words. <laughs> well, anyway, the New England aster is gorgeous in the garden with its tall spiky stems and button-like flowers. It likes average to dry soil in sunny locations and is a critical nectar plant for monarch butterflies. Helianthus divaricatus thrives in shady woodsy areas and is a host plant for the silvery checker spot butterfly. Both plants are a potent nutrition source for all of the pollinators and both are loved by songbirds. Now here's a stunning plant whose blooms will carry your garden into mid to late summer, Lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower. It loves a moist, sunny to part shade location. And you can see in this photo that it's perfect if you want to attract hummingbirds. Lubelia syphilitica tolerates borderline dry soils and partial shade. It's also a summer bloomer. It attracts hummingbirds too, but sweat bees and bumblebees really love it. And now for some fall blooming plants. Chelone glabra is a nice fall bloomer that helps extend the foraging season for pollinators. Bumblebees particularly like it, and it is a host for the Baltimore checker spot, a butterfly that ranges from Canada down the eastern U.S. to North Carolina. Like Chelone glabra, the blue mist flower is another season extender for bees and butterflies. And like the Chelone, it likes sun to part shade and moist soil. Then there is the sunchoke or Jerusalem artichoke, which has the added benefit of producing potato-like tubers that are edible for us and wildlife alike. Other great additions to the landscape for fall color and energy sources for the pollinators are the asters and the goldenrods. Now let's talk about some very friendly non-natives because not all are bad and in fact, some are beneficial. Echinacea purpurea and its cultivars are an example of high performing non-native plants that can benefit your pollinator garden. They are actually native to the Southern and the Midwestern regions of the United States. In a trial at the Mount Cuba Center from 2018 to 2020, researchers found six cultivars, all shown here, that were not only attractive to people, but received top marks from pollinators who showed a much higher preference for them than to other echinaceas. And the top performer of all was Picabella. The Mount Cuba Center also ran a trial on Coreopsis from 2013 to 2015 and found it to be another winner for supporting a wide diversity of pollinators, especially bees, wasps, and hoverflies. The cultivar in this photo, Coreopsis verticillata zagreb, is described by the Native Plant Trust as tough as nails, drought tolerant, and low maintenance, ideal for rocky areas and small gardens due to its compact size. It blooms in summer. Baptisia australis is another great addition to the pollinator garden, and I included it as a non-native because unlike its cousin Baptisia tinctoria, it's considered non-ecotypic in Vermont. But it does very well here and is a host plant for several butterfly species, including the wild indigo dusky wing, which is a native to Southern New England, but it's expanding its range into Vermont. And let's not forget about native shrubs, which provide color in the winter landscape and more importantly, they provide life-sustaining food to wildlife at a time of year when food is scarce. Winterberry is a native holly that can replace non-native holly in the Northern landscape. It's more nutritious than the non-native and its bright red berries can easily be seen by foraging birds. Hobblebush is another nutritional powerhouse. It blooms in spring, provides berries in summer, and in fall, its leaves turn red, yellow, and purple. 
It's a host plant for the spring azure butterfly. Be sure to check out which shrubs are native and which are not when you make your selections. And then there are the native trees, which are often keystone species. The author ecologist Michael Gage took this photo of a giant white oak in Vermont in 2014 and estimated it to be 300 years old. Now, Susan mentioned Doug Tallamy a little bit earlier, and anyone who knows the work of Doug Tallamy has heard these facts about oak trees. They support more than 900 species of Lepidoptera. Their acorns carry protein, fats, and carbohydrates so essential to birds and other wild leaf, wildlife. Oak leaf litter protects beneficial insects and suppresses invasives like Japanese stilt grass and Asian jumping worms. 25% of oak trees in the US are in trouble and their acorns can't be preserved in seed banks like other species. Although they are still doing okay in our neck of the woods, the same forces that are leading to their decline in other parts of the country are at work here. Forces that Susan mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, things like pests, diseases, habitat destruction, development, and agriculture. Beech is another native tree. Its edible nuts are essential, are essential energy sources for black bears, deer, wild turkeys, birds, and other wildlife. And as we mentioned earlier, it's the host for the early hair streak butterfly. Loss of beech trees is one of the reasons the early hair streak is endangered. So let's rethink our landscapes. Oh, we're, we're out of order here, Peg. We're out of order? Okay. So rethink, are we supposed to be on oh, slide? Oh, never, never mind. This is, this is good. Uh, okay. So we need to think about supporting the life cycles of pollinators throughout the year and what's happening with them at each season and what to do in your garden. So in the spring, leave your leaves, let sections of the lawn grow. In the summer, plant more native perennials. Uh, for the autumn, let the long stems remain on plants. For the winter, pollinators need shrubs for food and protection. So um, let's rethink our landscapes and see what changes we can make uh, to protect our pollinators and help them thrive. Um, oh, I see what I did here. Um, so in the spring, bees are, and other pollinating insects are just crawling out from their winter homes in the ground and under leaves. So that's why removing leaves too soon exposes them to the elements before they are ready. Leaving your spring lawn to grow while the bulbs, violets, and dandelions blossom provides extra food and habitat for early pollinators. Um, one thing we did at my house last year was to overseed our lawn with white clover, and it's really fun to see all that clover uh, blooming in the yard. In the summer, caterpillars are munching on those host plants. In autumn, pollinators are looking for winter homes, and they often choose the stems of tall flowers like bee balm or asters. In the winter, birds often shelter in shrubs and need the energy resources like winterberry provide. Peg? So how you can help. Throughout the seasons, watch for places that are missing blooms and choose plants to fill those times with blossoms. Often the wild weeds, for example, daisy and fleabane, Flowering grasses, yarrow, and Queen Anne's lace are just the right plants for our native insects. Planting groups to create clusters of habitat. Focus towards native plants with a diversity of shape, size, heights, and bloom time to provide for continuous habitat. And identify and remove invasive or aggressive plants. Less is more when it comes to yard cleanup and providing habitat for the insects and birds. Most culinary herbs have teeny flowers that attract a wide variety of pollinators. Letting your herbs go to flower, as well as native weeds, 
provides perfect habitat and a food source for many, many pollinators. Wild or messy spaces are preferred by many pollinators and beneficial insects. Let the edges of your yard merge into the wild of the forest or field. Leave some piles of brush and dead wood around. Add decorative posts, bird bats, and other landing spots to invite more diversity into your yard. So every year I convert more of my lawn to garden beds. Decades ago, I used to dig out the sod and that is really hard work. And then I learned the easy way. I save large pieces of cardboard and piles of newspaper. I remove any plastic tape and labels because they won't biodegrade and you will find them years later. I cover the area I want to convert uh, with at least four layers of newspaper. I wet it down or cardboard. I wet it down with a hose and I cover it with whatever I have that will become dirt. And so this depends on what's available to you, topsoil, compost, leaf mold, wood chips, straw. You can plan plant right away if you must by making holes in the cardboard and removing the grass in the hole. But if you can, it's really easiest to wait a few months until everything settles in. I usually make some new beds every fall. So some other things that you can do. You can start mowing later and see what comes up. Many early lawn weeds are excellent wild foods, such as violets, dandelion, and others. Many early lawn weeds are wonderful pollinator attractors, such as white clover, as Susan said, ground ivory, ivy, and flowering grasses. So Susan overseeded her lawn with white clover, as she told you. Just be careful about walking barefoot because the bees are going to be in there. Oh, leave unused areas unmowed throughout the summer and fall and try skipping every other mowing. My husband and I tried that this summer. It was a little hard to get used to, but once we did, we're really happy we did. We've seen lots of lots more insect activity in the lawn and our lawn is actually getting a little healthier. Um, increased grass root depth will increase soil health, water holding capacity and habitat for life. So on the left is um, a shot of my pollinator garden, part of it anyway, that I started in 2019, right after I completed the UVM Master Gardener course. So I was inspired by Jane Sorensen, who taught the unit on pollinator gardens, and I ordered 21 plants, including the Menarda shown here in the photo on the left, and I planted them early that summer. The plants were all only about four inches high. This photo was taken a year later and the Monada were over three feet tall. And last year I planted even more and they are catching up with the first year's plants that I grew this year. And so my garden's getting more and more beautiful. Susan? So I moved to Vermont about eight years ago and I've made a formal garden of mixed shrub and perennial beds. As I've learned more about the value of natives, I add them each year and I have about 25 species of trees and shrubs right now. This is on a half acre lot and about 40 species of perennials and grasses. And um, that's a lot, uh, but boy, there's so much room for more. So I just, I just add more every year and take away a little more lawn every year. So in spite of landscape fragmentation, new research shows that small gardens can make a big difference. If each homeowner creates a backyard habitat, we will create what Doug Tallamy calls the homegrown national park. No garden is too small, but I can assure you that once you get started, you'll be hooked. And have you heard of pollinator pathways? There is a growing movement to enlist homeowners as well as public entities to create these pollinator gardens. If enough are created, we can increase and even help restore the pollinators original ranges. A great resource to check out about this 
is www.pollinatorpathway.org, which will take you to the Pollinator Pathways Project of the Northeast. As I've come to appreciate the role of pollinators in native plants, I find that my aesthetic about what makes a beautiful garden is changing. When something grows that I didn't plant, I try to ID it and I might just leave it to see how it does. Letting go of tight control can be less work. You can reduce yard maintenance, you can let your herbs go to flower, you can let native weeds go to flower, you can leave naturally messy wild areas. Uh, be, beware of those invasives though that get in there, get those out. You can reduce your lawn area and you can mow less areas and less often. As we develop our garden habitat, we want to build an ecosystem with more diversity. Plant larger patches of flowers, plan for continuous blooms, aim for at least 80% of native plants, increase diversity of species, shape size and bloom time increase food foraging and protection for, for pollinators. And now it's time to make a plan for your own garden. Make a list based on these principles. Add native plants, add water sources, add shelter, reduce lawn, improve soil, leave the leaves and stems. What pieces of the ecosystem will you add this year? So here are some alternatives to invasive plants. If you go to this website, Vermont Invasives, you'll find um, lots and lots of substitutes. So you can get in there and rip those guys out and put some new ones in. I happen to have a problem with uh, wild grape in the forested part of my land. So uh, little by little, I've been taking that out and I'm trying to let the, the land recuperate from this invasion. I'm not sure what I'm gonna put in their place yet, but boy, they are really invasive. They're a problem. So I will check in with you on a, another date to let you know how I'm doing with that and what I chose to put in there. There are some other great sources that we'd like to bring your attention to. Um, at the University of Vermont, they have a mini course in their Master Gardener program. It's a mini course on pollinator gardens. And uh, if you go to the UVM website, you'll find it. It's self-paced. It's really chock full of information. Jane Sorensen is uh, one of the people who runs that course. And it's just really well done. The Xerces Society is another place to go to. The Native Plant Ch uh, Trust is another. And you can check out Native Plants for New England Gardens by Dan Jaffe. And there it is. And that's published by the Native Plant Trust. We're also happy to announce that the Wyndham Windsor Master Gardeners are offering a four hour workshop with Dan this fall and we can let you know at a future date or you can go to our Facebook page and you'll find out the exact date and time. But um, Dan is really popular. He spoke at our state conference last year and there were a lot of call outs to have him come back. So we're happy to provide that this fall. And I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that there are several places right here in Vermont that can help you get started with your native plants. These are all native plant suppliers. We've got Miller Hill Farm, Nasami Farm, which is down in Massachusetts, Northeast Pollinator Plants, which is Jane Sorensen's, um, her business. And that's where I got my native plants. And I can tell you they're fabulous. Turtle Hill Native Plants, the Vermont Wildflower Farm, and the East Hill Tree Farm. Um, there are also more out there. Uh, they're all over New Hampshire as well, New York, wherever you're from, check them out. And also ask your local nursery to start carrying native plants. The more our movement grows, the more we talk about native plants, 
the more it will get nurseries and commercial folks involved in providing them for us. And that will be better for all of us. And that's the end of our presentation, I believe. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming. And we hope you enjoyed it. It's been a fascinating journey for us to explore the world of pollinators and the plants that support them. And it all started with the UVM Extension Master Gardener program. If you'd like to learn more or to connect with the program or other master gardeners, go to the UVM Extension Master Gardener webpage. We are putting a link in the chat box to that. Um, the Master Gardener course instructors are UVM faculty and staff and Vermont horticulture professionals. The course curriculum covers the fundamentals of home gardening focused on plant and soil sciences. Topics include soil fertility, plant pests and diseases, fruit and vegetable production and planning, entomology, garden pollinator habitat, native plants, annuals and perennials, shrubs and trees, landscape design, and dealing with garden wildlife. The content is specific to the Vermont environment. You can also keep abreast of what we're doing in the Wyndham Windsor EMG chapter on our Facebook page at, uh, well, if somebody could put that in the chat for us, it's a little hard to read. It's uh, Facebook Wyndham, if you look for Wyndham Windsor chapter extension master gardeners, you should be able to find it on Facebook and other uh, Vermont master gardener chapters have Facebook pages also. Um, I might suggest that um, we're going to get into questions right now, but um, if you want to stay in touch, um, please come to our Facebook page and we can try to follow up and give you more resources. So uh, with that, Peg, anything to add? No, I think we're ready for questions. Okay. Um... All right, let's see. We have quite a few questions and comments um, that seem very interesting. Uh, let's see. Well, first of all, why do commercial growers get non-native bumblebees instead of native ones? And then, well, they're wondering if it's because they're cheaper. And then the side note was that after they are used as pollinators, they are then destroyed. Is that correct? You know, that's beyond my expertise. How about you, Peg? In my research, um, I didn't come across anything that talked about the, the, whether the bumblebees were really non-natives or natives. We know for sure that it's honeybees that are non-natives. Oh, right. I think, I think right. that what uh, we were talking about at that point in the presentation was the fact that bumblebees um, have been recruited for um, by commercial growers to use in greenhouses. And so they're probably like native honeybees transported around the country. So if they're brought to one greenhouse, you know, several miles away from their really truly native habitat, then they would be considered non-native bumblebees. Okay. But, um, but bumblebees are uh, apparently hard to use. I don't think they're used, I know they're not used as much as honeybees are used. And, um, but because they're such great pollinators, I think it's relatively new that commercial growers are actually using them compared to the use of honeybees after so many years. So one of, one of the best sources we've found about um, insects is xerces.com. That's X-E-R-C-E-S. Um, and they are, um, they're a wonderful resource. And don't forget that you can uh, contact uh, master, the Master Gardener helpline for any questions that you have. So next question. Okay. This one was wondering about how you prevent rabbits from eating your pollinated <laughs> garden. You have any tips? <laughs> My husband and I were just talking about this, not in regard to rabbits, but in regard to squirrels. <laughs> so, oh, yes. Yeah. So, I think for any, uh, this is kind of off the wall, I guess, but 
a long time ago, we were able to obtain powdered form coyote urine, and that worked. <laughs> you sprinkle a little around and you have to sprinkle it after every rainstorm, but it did work. We didn't have to trap them and have a hearts. We didn't have to, you know, do anything destructive to them. We just were able to shake the powder around the property and they scattered. They, they just didn't come back. So that's one thing. There are lots of, um, I don't know if they're old uh, myths or if they really work, but our, um, the guy that cuts our trees told us to hang bars of soap any type of soap that you get if you're out at a hotel or whatever, <laughs> just take that smelly soap and put it in a little bag with holes in it and they can't stand the smell. That works for deers. Um, hair, little bags of human hair work for deers. Mm -hmm. As far as rabbits go though, they have always been a problem, but I would suggest the coyote urine if you can handle it. <laughs> okay. We've got a question about oxide, oxide daisies. Now those are non-native, um, but let's see. And they deserve, do you agree that they deserve an invasive label? I, I have uh, got oxide daisies in my garden. And uh, what I do is I, um, I let a couple of them bloom just because they're pretty and I cut them. Uh, for for bouquets and then I tear them all out every year oh. and every year a few come back uh, so yes they are not native um, in in my yard they are not invasive I don't think that they are on the uh, noxious weeds list but they are um, you will si find them all over disturbed habitats um, so I think Peg, if you agree with me, we've found that in studying native plants, there it's not all or nothing. Um, native plants are ideal, uh, but there are plants that you can tolerate that are non-natives that do no harm. What we really want to focus on are the plants that do harm to environments. Mm. Okay. Um, well, there was another question along those lines. Um, for an example, the butterfly bush, um, is that considered invasive, non-native, but actually um, helpful in improving biodiversity? Peg, you wanna take that one? Yeah, again, we're not experts. So I would have to look that one up myself. Um, I, you know, as I selected the plants for this presentation, I came across so much information that honestly, I think I read about the butterfly bush, but I, I can't remember what I, um, what I learned about it. So my advice is go to some place like the Native Plant Trust. They are fabulous. They list all, all the native plants and in our area, in Massachusetts, New York, Vermont. They're just great about that. Another great source is the Xerces Society because they have a whole um, section on pollinator plants and what are natives and what are not natives. And then the final place um, to find that out would be to go to your local um, university extension school like the UVM Master Gardener Program. They have lots of information on what are invasives and what are not invasives. Oh, and the slide, that I showed you um, alternatives to common invasive plants, that's gonna be invaluable to you in any of the questions that you might have about what truly is invasive and, and, and what's okay to put in your garden. Can I comment on the Budalaya? Yes. Thanks. I did put it in the chat later on. It's one of the, it is actually an invasive. Um, and it's not necessarily as invasive in Vermont as it is further south because of the climate ah. so far. Anyhow, this is changing, of course, um, yeah. but it does spread and it, it is in, I think it's on the noxious weed list, at least in Pennsylvania and further south. Um, ah. Some plants aren't here, but the other really bad thing about 
Budalea in particular is because it is so attractive to pollinators and to butterflies and moths. And they come and um, then they don't have any host plant to lay their eggs on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because people don't realize that you have to have the host plants also for these butterflies. Ah. So it's one of the main problems. For, I, I think it's one of the worst of the plants because it's so um, uh, recommended by people wanting to attract pollinators. Ah, Cheryl, thank you for that. And I was hoping that at some point, because as I've said before, I'm no expert. I was hoping that people who knew a lot more than I do would chime in just like you did and, and share your knowledge. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm an ecologist. So I came to, to get some tips on being able to give presentations better because I'm a little nervous and I need to learn oh, how to give presentations. Uh, by, by the way, I, I think somehow uh, we we forgot to mention this. The reason that we developed this presentation is that we really want to um, advance education done by master gardeners in their local areas. So we have developed the slideshow and the script, and we are going to make that available to all Vermont net master gardeners. So if you are a master gardener and you'd like to do this at your local school or library or wherever, um, we, we will uh, give you this presentation. So um, we, we, really, we really wanna get the word out. Okay, I have another question. Are cultivars 100% useless to pollinators? We planted a specific type of oak cultivar due to space constraints. I can answer, I can answer that one. Cultivars um, can be very beneficial and it's why we did put a few slides about some of those very friendly non-native plants. I think the, the thing to investigate when you're choosing a cultivar is it has there been research done on it showing that it provides adequate nutrition to pollinators? Um, will it be attractive to them? And uh, you know, there were lots of other things. And if you rewatch the recording, you'll you'll see the slide. I can't get back to it right now, but there are lots of things that um, that come into play in the way that a pollinator will choose a plant to land on and to try to get food from. So finding the most nutritious and finding those studies like the Mount Cuba Center in Delaware is awesome. They've been doing research in their trial gardens for years now. So they have a wealth of information on all different types of cultivars. Um, so, yeah. And I'd also like to mention the work of Annie White in oh, Vermont. Yes. And Annie was part of our uh, Master Gardener course. Uh, she did some wonderful research on the value of nativars and cultivars. So really this, this is an area of research that is just really opening up. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you give people an idea of when it's okay to do the spring cleanup? as late as June 15th for toads, perhaps. I think it's after two weeks or so of above 50 degree weather. Does that sound right? <laughs> yes, that, that's the, the rule of thumb is wait until you've got some warm weather for them to get a chance to get out, uh, to leave the, their shelters naturally. Um, I find that in my own garden, it really depends on what I have planted there. Mm -hmm. I uh, cover, I do a lot of leaf mold. I make a lot of leaf mold. And so I do a lot of mulching uh, over the winter. And I have hundreds of bulbs, uh, mm. non-native bulbs, but I do love daffodils and other uh, flowers. And so if I don't take up any of the mulch or, or cut any, anything back, um, it's a real mess. And, and uh, so it's easier at some point to, it all depends on what you've got planted there. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've learned is not to cut back the stems all the way to the ground. So I leave a foot or so of, of the stem and it makes, it makes it much easier to get in and, and pull out mulch and so on. Peg, anything else? 
Yeah, I have lots of trees around the edges of my property and I just let the leaves go until I start to see the little spring ephemerals coming out. You know, they come out in May and late May and, you know, early June. And then I start to see the bumblebees starting to come out. I start, I look for the uh, presence of insects. And, um, and again, that warmer weather, a few days above 50 is really helpful. And so I just observe, and I think that's great advice to anybody to start observing your gardens in early spring and see what's coming out. And then you can make the determination. If you see that the, the bugs are coming out and they're ready to go and they've got their sources of food uh, ready to go, then I think you can start cleaning up the leaf litter at that point. I started mine this year. It was just so cold and wet in May, if you'll recall here in my part of Vermont. Um, I didn't start until late May uh, cleaning out my edges. Okay. Um, someone said they had an issue with a neighbor who harbors rats. Uh, should hmm. they be eliminating pile, their piles of brush or maybe super small piles of brush instead? No, that might be a little off topic, but I thought mm. maybe you had a suggestion. Yikes. Um. I, I don't I don't think I don't think I can speak to the issue of of rats. Um, <laughs> the, the, the most direct way would be to have a conversation with your neighbor and, and yes. a look at why this is happening. Yes. Um, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have so many compliments and thank yous here. Um, just wanted to let you know that um, more thank yous. Okay, limelight has taken over my daisies. Is there a way to leave a bit or plant it so that it doesn't take over? Limelight, do you mean hydrangea paniculata limelight? Which lime not light? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, it's in, in uh, quotes. Hmm. Um, but I'm not sure about that one. Okay, well, let's if see. It's, if it's hydrangea paniculata, um, I, I cut mine back quite a bit every year because they bloom on new wood. Okay, sounds good. Uh, are red oaks as beneficial as white oaks? Again, I think we'll refer you to Doug Tallamy's research on oaks, uh, but as I recall from his, uh, he, he did uh, recently a wonderful presentation through the Grafton Nature Museum. Uh, that that red oaks are as valuable as white oaks. Okay, I think I'm just going to end with a, a very nice thank you from someone. Thank you very much for an inspiring presentation. Really enjoyed it and wonderful to know that there are many of us who do care for the environment and are putting in the effort to make a positive change for pollinators. Listening in from South Africa, and while the specific planning is different, the principles remain the same. Thanks so much. Isn't that great? Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So okay. Anne, um, if you would like to wrap up and say goodbye and tell us, uh, we're, we are so grateful uh, for the uh, Rockingham Free Library, Public Library for hosting this Zoom meeting and it's been a wonderful collaboration. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Anne. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to mention a few things that are going on in the library. The adult programs are slowing down for a bit so people can get in their gardens. <laughs> but the, um, the summer reading program for the children is just um, starting up and there's going to be a special events um, like it will all be outside for, for family activities. One is a theater group, then the Southern Vermont Natural History Museum will be coming with wild animals. Um, there'll be an annual stuffed animal sleepover that will be filmed and shown on YouTube. We'll have a storyteller um, telling earth tales from around the world. And there'll be a tie dye and ice cream 
social that you'll need to get tickets for, <laughs> but they are free. Uh, we have bookmarks and uh, two different story times each week, one for um, preschool and one for uh, babies. And we have teen programs such as the uh, Friday night teen tabletop gaming. And we have a monthly book group for young adults and a mini art show where teens can come and pick up their tiny little um, canvas on a tiny easel and they can, they can um, paint a masterpiece that will then be shown at the library. And lots of other things going on too, but those are the, 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 big, the big ones. So we hope that um, you call us at the library at 802-463-4270 or um, email, uh, well, check our website, rockinghamlibrary.org. And um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of us. Our emails are on the website mm -hmm. if you want to get a hold of someone in particular. And thank you so much, ladies, for doing this wonderful show. You're welcome. <laughs> All and right, everybody. It looks like a beautiful day, at least here in Southern Vermont. So time to get out in your garden. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.